and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. We recently moved to a small farm. Here lately, I started walking on the road that leads to the farm. It's a small, small road, and it's very narrow. In fact, it's only wide enough for really one vehicle to go through. As I was walking on the road here lately, I was wondering just how narrow is the narrow path that leads to life? How narrow is the gate that we are to enter through? <laughs> how do we know if we're even on the narrow path that leads to life? I mean, you know, everybody, everyone who calls themselves a believer thinks they're on that narrow road. But is that the case? Does just being a believer in Yeshua put you on the narrow road? <laughs> it seems the theory, that theory anyway, is proven wrong just a few verses farther down in chapter 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and perform many miracles? The people mentioned here in these verses obviously thought they were believers as they cried out to our Savior, Lord, Lord. And then they even mentioned all the things they did in his name. This verse shows us that just being a believer doesn't put you on the narrow road. <laughs> Neither does performing miracles in his name. That being the case, what does put someone on the narrow road? I mean, <laughs> what does it mean to enter through the narrow gate? Verse 21 shows that many believe they were on it, but the hard truth came too late for them. Let's not forget that Yeshua said that he is the gate. John chapter 10. Therefore Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. And two verses later, verse 9. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. So, Yeshua says that he is the gate, the gate that leads to life. This parallels with how he also said that he is the way, truth, and the life in John chapter 14. So, he is the gate that leads to life. We also know that he is the word of God, according to John chapter 1 verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So then, the Word, who is Yeshua, is the gate that leads to life. The question then becomes, well, what is the Word of God? Not by how we define it, but how it was defined from John when he wrote, chapter 1, verse 14. That will give us the definition of Yeshua, thus giving us the definition of the gate. The word used in John, chapter 1, is logos. It's the same word that Yeshua used in the parable of the sower. Luke, chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock. When it came up, the plants withered, because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then to verse 11. This is the meaning of the parable. 
The seed is the word, logos, of God. <laughs> this parable goes in line with what James taught too. James chapter 1. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word, logos, planted in you, which can save you. This parable from Yeshua is all about the word taking root into our lives and producing fruit. <laughs> this is why James says one verse later, James chapter 1, verse 22, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. <laughs> Interestingly enough, just after Yeshua explains the parable of the sower regarding the word of God, he says what we are to do with the word of God. Look five verses later at verse 20. Someone told him, Your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. He replied, My mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. <laughs> then, just three chapters later, he virtually says the same thing. Luke 11, verse 27. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. The word for obey here actually means to guard, to keep. If we plant an apple seed, will an orange or pear tree sprout? <laughs> of course not. Plant an apple, get an apple. When the word of God is planted in you, <laughs> the word of God should come out of you. Many wish to debate the Greek word logos as to its meaning. They argue that it can't mean or even consist of the law of God. However, how can the word that Yeshua tells us to practice and obey be referring to anything other than the law as given to us in the Old Testament? Look at what Yeshua equates the word of God to. Mark chapter 7. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. Anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is Corbin, that is, a gift devoted to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Here we see Yeshua himself equating the word Logos of God with the commands of God. Can it be any more plain than this? Let's examine Peter's use of Logos. 1 Peter chapter 1 For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. First, we see the same reference as given by Yeshua himself and of James with it being planted as a seed. <laughs> then Peter calls it living and enduring. So then, what is the living and enduring word of God? Hebrews chapter 4. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The next verse in 1 Peter is critical. Why? Because Peter then defines what that living and enduring word of God is. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24. For all men are like grass 
and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word, Rhema, of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word, Rhema, that was preached to you. Now here we see Peter discussing the Logos of God in verse 23. He defines it by referencing the Hebrew scriptures of Isaiah. What was the word of the Lord to Isaiah? <laughs> There's no doubt, it was the law. So, we see Peter equating the Logos of God in verse 23 as the rhema of the Lord in verse 25. Where else do we see the rhema of the Lord? Romans chapter 10. But what does it say? The word rhema is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word rhema of faith we are proclaiming. Now this is Paul quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 14. No, the word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so you may obey it. So, what is this word that is to be obeyed here? Let's continue reading. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 and 16. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love Yahweh your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and Yahweh your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. So the word Paul was quoting and proclaiming here in Romans 10 is the law. This happens to be the same word that Peter was proclaiming in 1 Peter 1.25, which was equated as the Logos of God. In verse 23, therefore, making the Logos of God the law of God. In quick review, it's through the narrow gate that we are to enter. The gate being Yeshua. Yeshua being the Word or Logos of God. And the Logos of God being the Rhema of God, which is the law of God. Now let us not forget that it is the law of God that Yeshua lived out and exemplified for us. Look at Paul's words in 1 Corinthians. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And 1 John chapter 2. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Yeshua did. You know, one who chooses to follow Yeshua will thereby exemplify that choice by following his example, <laughs> you know, by pursuing obedience to the law of God. That's what Yeshua did. This is how we show our love for God. First John chapter 5, this is love for God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. You know, the sad part about the narrow road is that only a few find it. You know, this means that they're looking. They're actually looking for it, but they're looking in the wrong places. But the thing is, since they're looking, they think, or at least they consider themselves believers. But that's, that doesn't mean they're believers, <laughs> okay? Just because you're searching for something does not mean that puts you in the label of being a believer. But that which many find and follow is based on man's teachings and traditions and not, not the eternal word. Though they may think they are, they're not. And that's, that's what I guess that bothers me the most is like, not everyone who claims to be believers are believers because they're not following the eternal word. They're not following the logos the rhema that was shared by Peter, Paul, and even Yeshua himself. <laughs> if they persist on that path, one day, one day they may hear the word Yeshua said just seven verses down from our text. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, 
Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now keep in mind, the Greek for the word evildoers is actually a phrase that says workers of lawlessness. So in verse 13, we are told to enter through the narrow gate, Matthew 7, 13. The gate being himself, himself being the word, logos of God, and the word of God being the rhema of God, that being the law of God. Then, just 10 verses later, in verse 23, we see that those who are workers of lawlessness, those not pursuing the law, or logos, are not allowed through the gate. The law provides us with guidelines to which we are given to govern our lives, guidelines which the Father has given out of His divine and eternal wisdom. <laughs> when we are purposefully stepping outside of these guidelines, we are in essence telling God that we know better, <laughs> thereby taking ourselves off the narrow road that He has provided. Walking the narrow road does not come without persecution. In fact, the very word used for narrow in Matthew chapter 7, verse 14, actually means to crush, compress, oppress, and even trouble. Giving understanding to Paul's words in 2 Timothy chapter 3. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Where are you walking today? Are you on the right road to get you through the narrow gate? Think about it. Pray about it. But more than anything, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Until next time, Shalom.